All right, welcome back. And of course, we want to have that conversation around the budget. We want to understand what should we expect going forward. And uh, my guest, as earlier introduced, we have Anne Wangeshi from ISPAC, that is the Institute of Certified Public Accountant, Accountants of Kenya. And we also have Christopher Odongo, the CEO of World International. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right, first, first things first. I want to get your sentiments. When, when you look, as we look forward to this budget 23, 24, what do you feel about it, Chris? Are you, are you optimistic? Are you jittery? Where are you? I think for me personally, I'm, very, I'm, very, I'm a very positive person and I'm a very optimistic person. And so whenever I find anything, anything policy related, business related, I always look for both good and, and bad and, and, and it comes. And then I ask myself, what is my response going to be? Because ultimately, I have to take responsibility and I have to take ownership of my own success. It's all going to be generated from, from external factors. And so you always look for what's, what's the good inside anything that is packaged to you. Yeah. And so when I look at this uh, government policy and this budget policy, I'm actually thinking that it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of bad news uh, and there's been a lot of cry mm -hmm. uh, and we can say in a sense that the worst is yet to come. But at the same time, there are pockets and things of what can I do to actually succeed despite, uh, despite the, the negativity. All right, of course, we'll be talking more about the good, the bad, and the, I don't want to call it ugly, but the one that uh, we really do not want to talk about. <laughs> but Anne, let me get your sentiments about, around this budget. How do you feel about it? I remember there's a time when everyone would be glued on their screens, hoping for some good news, curry, meshuka, something like that, something positive. Now we're talking of a uh, two kilogram bag of sugar going for what, 450? How do you feel about this going forward? What, what are you expecting? Uh, thank you, Jimmy. I think for me as a person, I'm looking forward to the budget on Thursday. Uh, we've talked so much about the finance bill and we expect many changes into the budget. Uh, areas that will be affected, uh, of course, there'll be tax increases. Um, once the budget is read, then um, Kenyans can be able to see, uh, being that it's the first budget of Kenya Kwanzaa government and um, their agenda was premised on better um, bottom-up economic transformation agenda. Yeah. For me, I want to see that transformation. And whether whatever they've put in really will transform the economy, uh, bearing in mind that currently, like you've said, the high cost of living, it's becoming unbearable. So looking forward to Thursday. All right, so uh, and actually, now let's get to the meat of this conversation. And I'm sure you've interacted with the budget policy statement, you've interacted with the medium term uh, budget and, and those uh, medium term measures. And one of the things that we, I really want to get uh, a feel from where you sit uh, mm -hmm. as a numbers person, mm -hmm. do you feel we have allocated enough to the sectors that are going to spark growth in the economy? Um, personally, I think yes. Uh, we have uh, priority areas. And I want to admit that every government has its own priority areas mm -hmm. uh, based on their manifesto. And you cannot say whether or not those numbers will spur. But looking at, um, I think the big debate has been on housing yeah. and whether that will spur economic growth. I think um, it's, it's, it's an issue of a wait and see. I think uh, there's been a, a bit of agreement in terms of what we can do for the housing. But uh, we have uh, agriculture, a main, a main driver to, to, the, to, the, to the GDP. Yeah. We ask ourselves, and uh, the government has already put in the um, subsidy in terms of production, but we ask ourselves, is it enough? Is just giving fertilizer enough mm -hmm. to, to ensure that we have um, enough food production? Uh, what else can we do as a country to ensure that uh, the money that it has been put in by government, mm. then spurs. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, and I'm looking at uh, the issue of having agric agricultural extension officers. Because you can be given the fertilizer, yeah. but you don't know how much mm -hmm. is enough to put per acreage. So I think uh, there's a gap. Mm -hmm. We can do better as a country to be able to ensure that we have efficiency, even in the subsidies. All right. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and I know, Chris, you mm. will 
Mm. The Mwanainchi guy, you are the SME mm. guy, but when you sit back, when you look at the priorities that this government is issuing, when you look at uh, some of these priorities like subsidizing production, this is something we've had over and over again. When you look at uh, uh, things like fertilizer, for instance, that is one aspect of production, but there are things like rain. We cannot control when it mm. rains, when mm. it doesn't rain. Yeah. Do you feel this bottom-up agenda is mm. actually, uh, when you look at the budget uh, policy statement, for instance, do you think it's being supported by the funding that, uh, yeah. that, that is required? Yeah, I think, I think the government has its priorities on housing, agriculture, uh, creative economy, uh, micro and small medium-sized enterprises, and that's very telling because from, from previous governments, they've not said micro and small enterprises. They've said other things. But this government has really said they are there for micro and small enterprises. They've even gone ahead and created a ministry, and it's actually named micro and small enterprises. You know, that just tells you the kind of focus they have. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to how they're actually also planning to fund this whole thing, they've also gone back and said, you guys are also going to fund this. And so they've actually created ta uh, tax measures to collect money from micro and small enterprises. And so in a sense, they, they are targeting the sector, but they're also asking, actually asking the sector to finance itself. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So again, uh, and it's a good thing that you've mentioned the issue of taxes. One thing that we are reliably informed is going to remain the same is the VAT on fuel. The 16% is going to remain the same. So when you look at the cost of production, which is uh, uh, what attracts manufacturing, which is what uh, creates jobs for, for any economy. When you see something like VAT on fuel being at 16%, of course, mm. the cost of production is going to go up, mm. the cost of uh, goods is going to go up. What do you make of that? Is that the, a step in the right direction, or do we need to just stop complaining and get on with it? And I think... Uh, okay, uh, we'll, okay. Uh, 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 Chris, you can go first. <laughs> yeah, let me yeah. go first. I think... Um, there is, there is in, in business, there's sometimes what is sort of called a victim mentality, and then there's also a proactive mentality. And, and, and true to it, if you look at the budget, if you look at what the government is trying to do, you know, as a business owner, you, you really have to search for opportunities in there and find the, the diamond that is hidden in the dirt. Mm -hmm. you know? But then at the same time, you also have to ask yourself that in the face of such pressure in the face of such problems in the face of such adversity what innovative things can you begin to do and so adversity drives innovation and so the the, the most innovative entrepreneurs are going to be winners going forward mm -hmm. the most creative <coughs> entrepreneurs are going to be winners going forward but it doesn't mean that there's no opportunity within that particular constraint space the opportunities are there you just have to find them yeah yeah all right and and of course uh, the other thing that uh, we would really want to talk about is the question of revenue the debate about whether Kenyans are being overtaxed or not has been raging on for quite some time. We're always talking about a progressive budget. I remember at one time, uh, then MP Moses Kuri telling me that we, are, we have a budget, that, but we do not have the resources to finance it. Then he was still an MP. Now, as a government official, uh, I'm sure the, the tune is different, the opinion is different. But from where you sit, when you look at the government saying that we target to raise about 2.7, trillion shillings in revenue is that no, uh, first of all is it feasible uh, from a numbers perspective uh jimmy i think uh, looking at what we had last year i think the government was able to raise around 1.9 uh so 2.7 it's a little bit on the higher side I, I i'm not sure whether we have we are able as a country to raise that money. Mm -hmm. But I want to agree uh, partly in regards to the, pro uh, the tax VAT on uh, petroleum products. Yeah. And I'm sure uh, KRA has been struggling to ensure that they bring in as many people into the tax bracket as possible. And uh, they expand the tax base. And I think one of the major areas or the main areas has been the MSMEs and how mm -hmm. to tax the MSMEs. Um, I think as a country we can do better in terms of facilitating MSMEs to, to be in a formal setup because mm -hmm. currently most of them are in an informal setup where they are not doing books of accounts. There is so much that they can, they can be helped with to ensure that now they are able to start paying taxes yeah. uh, appropriately and, and getting into the tax bracket. But for VAT on petroleum products, I agree with you that that is going to bring a lot of problems. Mm. We can see a lot of uh, goods 
uh, going up. Uh, we, I, I think we have not seen the worst of it yet. Uh, I want to agree with you. We have not seen the worst of it yet because most of the producers and manufacturers will pass over uh, that particular uh, component to, mm -hmm. to the consumer. So it's a real, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Chris, uh, again, just to get you back to this, mm -hmm. uh, to weigh in on this matter of uh, revenue collection, yeah. 2.7 uh, trillion shillings. Mm -hmm. Is this tenable? Is it feasible from where you sit? Again, mm -hmm. you will remember that a good, a significant number of Kenyans have left formal employment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So many Kenyans have lost jobs because of the economic situation that we currently have in the country. 2.7 trillion, that is the figure we want to raise. Mm -hmm. Is it feasible? Is it... I think, it's, I think it's feasible uh -huh. because I think one of the things that we are forgetting as a country is the advancement of technology and the ability of the taxman to leverage on technology to, uh, to enforce. You know, they've just recently rolled out the, uh, the ETR, you know, and, and, and this particular one is actually going to be very stringent in terms of compliance. Within the proposals, there are proposals that are actually going to force certain tax collectors or tax agents to remit money as they collect it, especially on excise duty. There are certain excise duty bans that have been earmarked whereby you collect and you remit within 24 hours and some within a week, which basically means they're increasing liquidity. And mm -hmm. so technology is actually helping this. We are a country that does a lot of mobile money payments. We are a country that does also a lot of electronic payments. Bank-to-bank uh, -bank transfers, person-to-person -person transfers are all electronic. Which yeah. actually means that at, at the disposal of the revenue collector is a technology system or a technology base that allows them to draw more people into the, into the base of collection. And so I think that it's actually feasible for them to collect if they can leverage technology to expand the tax bracket. It's not so much can they burden more of the people who have been paying taxes, but can they bring more of the people who have not been paying to start paying. Can they, uh, can they increase compliance? Mm -hmm. And I think they're doing the right things to try and get there. Be because again, my worry is, we have, we've, we've had this conversation before, yeah. where one administration will talk about increasing the tax bracket, but in reality, the tax bracket, there's no room for, for it to be increased. Yeah. The number of people that you're looking for, I mean, yeah. informal sector, they the digital economy where you cannot tax them. So, so now, you see, that's, that's a legacy problem that we have as a country. Because in Kenya today, I can wake up and start a business. No registration required. I basically go and start selling something on the streets as a yeah. hawker. I've started a business. That's very easy. Our neighbors, Rwanda, you can't do that. You can't just wake up, go into Kigali City and start hawking without a license, without a permit, without a registration. Whereas on their side, what they've done is they've lowered the barrier to formalizing your business. But they've also made sure that at the moment that you start your business, you start it as a formal business. Yeah. Here in Kenya, it's quite the contrary. If I go to Kiambu town, I can be a hawker. If I go to Wangige town, I can be a hawker. If I go to a, a Hero town, I can be a hawker. And I don't actually have to register anywhere. Mm -hmm. But you see, we need to begin to teach our business people right from the start, basics level, basic levels of formalization. You start hawking, you have to buy a daily permit. Yeah. Okay? For you to buy a daily permit, you need to register. A basic registration. Mm -hmm. Name, PIN, but you have a permit. Now, it's actually forcing and teaching you how to formalize. So that over time, as your business, and then also creating structures for your business to grow. Actually, what we have is a very disorderly country. You know, I don't know whether you've driven past Kangemi. Yeah. You know? How do you collect taxes from a person who is illegally selling their wares on the road? Mm -hmm. First of all, they're there illegally. So I don't know. We, ha we have to sort of at some point make a decision. Do you want to be highly informal or do you actually want to be progressively formal? All right. Now, of course, we again, we've always talked about a progressive budget. Every year's budget, we expect it to rise by a certain margin. And this year is no different. We're talking about a budget of about 3.6 trillion. This is already is up from the 3.3 trillion we had last year. Now, um, the question that comes to mind is this, the, this, the, uh, the part of deficit. We're talking about a deficit of uh, about 720 billion shillings that has to be financed somehow. Now, from 
from some of the documents we've seen from Treasury, there are uh, the provisions for, for this financing. We're looking at 521 billion uh, will be borrowed domestically and about 198 billion from the external market. From where you sit, number one, is, is the, what effect will this have in terms of borrowing this heavily from the domestic market? Uh, thank you, Jimmy. I think it's important for me to bring in the context of where we as a country in terms of our debt stock. Yeah. I think as at the uh, end of um, December, there was 9.1 or something like that. Um, so we are almost hitting the 10 trillion mark. And um, of course, there's, there's always an issue of borrowing domestically because mm. what that does is that it eases the pressure and creates pressure on um, the other markets where mm. uh, other producers and other manufacturers and other people cannot borrow them uh, locally mm -hmm. because uh, banks will prefer to lend to, to government. And therefore that creates pressure because credit will not be available to the same as MSMEs mm -hmm. that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And these MSMEs need to grow mm -hmm. and they can only grow through credit. So I think uh, as a country, we, it is almost a catch-22. Yeah. Because remember, the Kenya shilling has been depreciating. And uh, borrowing externally then creates that pressure also. Because you borrow, say you borrow in dollars, then you have to pay. Mm -hmm. And that, I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's a balance. I think the government currently is just doing a balance okay. to ensure mm -hmm. that there's no pressure, uh, especially with, with a depreciating Kenya shilling. Yeah. And speaking of balance, Chris, do, do you feel, I am personally of the opinion that we need to balance 50% from it, we should get it from the local market, from yes. the domestic market, yeah. another 50% get it from the external market. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I think there are other forces that we have to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, one, there's a global economy and the global financial markets are in a period of crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia, Ukraine war. Uh, people recovering just post-COVID, yes. which means that uh, financial capital is flowing back to America in terms of the demand for the dollar. Those are global shifts. And also, the, there's, uh, there's talk about people moving away from the dollar into other currencies, China, India, Brazil, uh, Russia. And that basically has its own uh, tectonic shifts in terms of the global currency. But then back home, we also have inflation. You know, and there's global inflation as well. You yeah. know, if you look at uh, London or you look at uh, America, there has been inflation. Now, locally, we also have inflation. And one of the instruments that the central bank has for taming inflation is actually borrowing from the domestic market. Mm -hmm. So they must borrow. Otherwise, if they don't borrow, then again, we are going to have runaway inflation and runaway co uh, costs of living. Yes. So as, as, as Wangeshi has rightly put it, it's sort of like a, a catch situation. If you don't borrow, uh, and, and increase interest rates, mm -hmm. then you will have inflation anyway. So the cost of living or the cost of production locally will be higher. Yeah. If, you, if you borrow too much from the local economy and increase interest rates, you know, then again, you will stifle out uh, private sector credit to the capital providers that so much need it. So government has a delicate balancing act to be able to ensure that uh, inflation is tamed, but the cost of money or the cost of capital is also at a at a good place all right bearing in mind that you have global forces at play which kenya is just you know it's like if america sneezes we catch a cold so mm -hmm. what are we going to do so yeah. All right. It's a, it's a balancing act that, of course, we have, uh, we hope they will be able to balance it out perfectly. Now, Anne, you would know something about balancing. So <laughs> one thing that we normally have to make provisions for, and we've seen this with every budget cycle in the supplementary budget. I just want to get your thoughts. Should we be expecting a supplementary budget in the near future, immediately after this budget? Are we likely to hear thoughts about a supplementary budget in one in 30 seconds each, and then we can wrap it up? Um, definitely. Uh, we are likely to hear of a supplementary budget in two folds. One, if we are not able to meet our um, expectations in terms of revenue collection, then we'll expect the government to drop down in terms of uh, the total budget. Mm -hmm. Number two, in terms of uh, their specific areas, maybe the government might in, in some way feel like they under budgeted, but that should be the last 
case scenario. We okay. don't, we feel like they should only budget as appropriate. Thank All you. All right, Chris, final thoughts? In high school, we used to say, have a saying, mm -hmm. last minute can save a man, mm -hmm. which really is to say, <laughs> yeah. you can do something at the last minute. And it's, a, it's sort of like a Kenyan culture. We like waiting until the very last moment to do things. And mm -hmm. so, one of the things that affects our budget estimates that forces our government to go into supplementary budgets is normally execution. You know, when you don't actually do the things that you said you will do, mm -hmm. and so you have to go back to parliament to say, look, we have to revise our estimates. Yeah. Either we've underspent in mm -hmm. some areas, therefore we need to reallocate that money to other areas, or we've overspent in some areas and we need more money to be able to cover what we need. And so that is bound to happen, mm -hmm. you know. And, and obviously the usual... Um, uh, corruption and and its and its and its sons that come to make sure that we've overrun our our previous estimates. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for making time, and of course, we will be looking forward to Thursday, and we'll be glad to have you guys over again just to do a post mortem of what came of the budget. But for now, that's how we want to wrap it up. But before we do that, uh, the finance bill, we understand there have been some amendments. One of them is actually on the issue of housing. Now it has been lowered to about 1.5% uh, of your salary and uh, the employer has been spared in this case where the, uh, only the employee will be remitting the 1.5. And of course, we'll be giving you more details about uh, the finance bill once it's tabled. But for now, my name is Jimmy Bobo. Thank you so much for watching. Biwia KTN is up next.